Well, good afternoon, and, uh, and welcome to the Boston Foundation. Uh, I'm Paul Grogan, the President, and it is a great pleasure to see this room filled, as well as an overflow room uh, next door. So I guess we can conclude that there's more than casual interest in this uh, uh, subject. Uh, we are, in effect, going to present the community with a report today on the progress of Success Boston, the major college completion initiative that has been underway in, in recent years. And I hope it doesn't spoil it if I say that I, I think there's quite a bit of good news um, in the report, uh, which should make this a very happy, even a, a, a joyous time. But of course, a pall has been cast over, really, the, the nation by the events in Orlando, Florida um, over the weekend. Uh, truly, truly uh, appalling. Uh, ironically, uh, just uh, a few days ago last week, we were very pleased to host a major gathering of the LGBTQ community to celebrate the progress of the endowed fund here at the Boston Foundation, the Equality Fund. So that just deepens our sense of uh, extreme dismay and sorrow uh, uh, over, this, uh, over this occasion. But we do have work to do, and we have to go on, and we will. The Boston Foundation is already in touch with our counterpart foundation. Uh, in Orlando, the Central Florida Foundation, and we plan to be very active in helping that wonderful community recover from this ghastly uh, occasion. Um, I think everyone here, there's so many familiar faces, is, uh, and you know the Boston Foundation is Greater Boston's uh, Community Foundation, a 100-year-old charity uh, that uses its philanthropic resources to create a vital and prosperous Boston in which there is justice and opportunity uh, for all. Well, today we're talking about opportunity. We launched Success Boston in November 2008 in response to a longitudinal study done by the Center, Market, Center for Labor Market Statistics at Northeastern University and the Private Industry Council. We were pleased to sponsor that study at the Boston Foundation. And the original report, we'll remember, uh, was not very agreeable. It found uh, that only 64 percent of the Boston Public School graduates enrolled in post-secondary education and only about a third uh, obtained a degree of any kind uh, within six years of their graduation. Um, we were a community that had enjoyed very high enrollment rates in college for an urban district, but this was the first ever look at uh, completion, and uh, it was a sobering uh, result that was splashed across the front pages of the Boston Globe and other uh, media uh, outlets. Um, but in response, a very un-Boston thing happened. There was no blame game. There was no finger pointing. There was no attacking the report, the veracity of the report. Instead, uh, led by Mayor Menino, a group of us uh, gathered, agreed that this state of affairs was unacceptable and vowed to do something about it. And the result was uh, an incredible partnership uh, between, uh, among City Hall, uh, the school system, the business community, the nonprofit community, and the higher ed. Uh, community. And that partnership formed in the wake of this report being released in 2008, and it is still very much in place uh, going great guns. We set a firm goal to raise the gra college graduation rate of Boston Public School graduates to 52 percent, uh, up from that uh, third, which is virtually a 50 percent increase in the college graduation rate. We committed to work together across sectors and to be driven by data. Uh, we think this partnership and shared accountability is what will help more students succeed. I also want to credit the tremendous coaches on the front line of Success Boston. I spent some time with a Success Boston coach last week when we were pleased to do an appearance on the Egan and Browdy uh, radio program, and I was so impressed and pleased that a large radio audience was exposed to the dedication, poise, and empathy that these coaches bring to this effort every day. We also know the graduation rate for the class of 2009, and I'm happy to say that we're within a percentage point of our goal of 52 percent that we set in 2008. And keep in mind, we've accomplished this while scaling up the program to serve more students. So in absolute numbers, we've gone from some 735 college graduates for the class of 2000 to 1,314 for the class of 2009. That's an increase of nearly 80 percent in the young people from the Boston Public Schools graduating from college. And we have put such 
zeal into this effort because of the importance uh, of college uh, completion. Uh, you know, we all like to say there's no such thing as a silver bullet, but my experience with this program has convinced me that college completion may be as close to a silver bullet as we get, given the enormous benefits, both individual and societal, that flow from college graduations. Whether you want to talk about lifetime earnings, college graduates will earn about a million dollars more over their careers than high school graduates. If you want to talk about unemployment, the unemployment rate for 25 to 44-year-olds who have a college degree is 2.3 percent, uh, compared to 7.4 percent for those with just a high school diploma. So we're going to debate higher education, and, and uh, there's a big conversation going on here and across the country. But uh, do not doubt uh, that while we have this debate uh, about higher education and what the benefits are, that. Uh, a 2.3 percent unemployment rate is uh, uh, pretty amazing. Health insurance. Uh, far more college graduates will have health insurance than uh, high school graduates. Uh, voting. Uh, college graduates are about twice as likely uh, to vote uh, as uh, non-college graduates. Uh, you will be more, uh, more engaged, more involved. So the benefits are really uh, quite uh, extraordinary. Up until this year, we've been able to offer the coaching to about 300 young people. Uh, this year, thanks to the acquisition of a federal social innovation fund grant, uh, we have taken that uh, to uh, uh, 1,000. And that's as we speak, 1,000 graduates of the Boston Public Schools are enjoying the highly effective coaching provided by the nonprofits in success. Uh, Boston, and we believe that's going to have a huge effect in further upping the graduation rate and improving year-to-year -year persistence. And we're going to hear much more detail about this uh, from our two researchers who I, I will introduce uh, uh, in a moment. I do want to say that the late Mayor Menino deserves enormous uh, credit uh, for where we are uh, right now. Without his leadership, the kind of partnership that formed uh, just uh, wouldn't have happened. And, uh, you know, so he used his chagrin at the numbers that the study uh, produced uh, very, very uh, positively. And he was the first and may still be the only mayor who voluntarily accepted responsibility for the college graduation rate of the young people in his community. Uh, nobody else has ever done that. And it set a tone of cross-accountability that has governed this uh, magnificent uh, initiative. And I also want to thank Mayor Walsh for embracing this program, which he has done. And he's sorry that he's unable to be here today, but Ron Dorsey, his top education advisor, uh, is. Um, you know, uh, in politics, it's very often the case that a, a new elected official comes in and they don't want to hear about what the other guy did. They want to do their own thing uh, and start all over. And certainly, there are a lot of new things that Mayor Walsh has brought us. But he's embraced this program as if it were uh, his own. And that's, of course, an enormous uh, uh, benefit uh, uh, to all. I believe that every major city in America should do what we did, which can be done with existing data. Uh, that's available uh, to any city to really find out the truth about college graduation rates in their community. I think it would be a national uh, galvanizing uh, incident. But uh, we can't worry about that. We're worried about Boston. And today we get to hold up a mirror to the results and, uh, and see where we are. Uh, thank you all uh, for being here for this very important discussion. It's now my pleasure to introduce the two who will take us through the data. First, uh, Joe McLaughlin, the Research and Evaluation Director for the Boston Private Industry Council. Uh, and we also have Tamara Linkow, who's a Senior Associate at APT Associates. Please welcome them. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. As Paul mentioned, my name is Joe McLaughlin. I'm the Research Evaluation Director at the Boston PIC. And I prepared, uh, with the help of uh, my team at the PIC, um, Neil Sullivan, Annika Van Eden, prepared Chapter 1 of our study, the six-year college enrollment completion experience of BPS Class of 2009 graduates. Now, this study is, is really building on um, a lot of work that has been done over the past eight or nine years here in Boston, particularly by the Center for Labor Market Studies. As Paul mentioned, their first report uh, came out in 2008 called Getting to the Finish Line, and that tracked the BPS class of 2000, which is a baseline year for a lot of comparisons in our study. 
They've also, CMS also produced a report in 2013. Uh, it's called Getting Closer to a Finish Line. Uh, those of you that, remember, that uh, have read it will remember that we looked at the class of 2000, 2003, 2005, and then early persistence findings from more recent classes in that, in that report. So this study really builds off, off of what, what we know and answers the key question that, you know, six years out for the class of 2009, did, did that class reach the 52% goal that we set back eight, seven, eight years ago? Now, how we do it, just quick word on the data. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we use the National Student Clearinghouse, which is the primary data source in this study. It covered, back in 2009, when our class 2009 was enrolling in college, it covered 97% of all two and four year college enrollments in Massachusetts, and it also captures the majority nationwide as well. So we could track BPS graduates throughout the country. And then what we do is we link that student level data from the clearinghouse uh, with, with BPS data that's provided by um, uh, the Boston Public Schools to facilitate this work, and we create a longitudinal file so we could track outcomes for gender, race, ethnicity, graduating high school, and we could do more than that as well and plan to in the coming years in terms of looking at other special student subgroups. And this study, as I mentioned, is building off a large body of work. So when you do that, you try to compare to where you, where you were in the past, and you also want to align with new national research that's out there. So we have multiple measures of college enrollment and graduation throughout the report. For this, for this short discussion today, I just kind of picked the, the, the top highlights, um, and you'll, you'll see um, I track on most measures what, where we've come since 2000. Now quickly, in order to complete college, which is kind of the main focus of this, this report, you have to enroll. And the way we measure the 52% completion rate is we look at first year enrollees. So that's what the goal is based on. We track everyone that enrolls, everyone from the class of 2009 that enrolls within the fall or spring, immediately after high school, and we follow them for six years. And this, this, this short table just provides some numbers. That, that bottom row that's shaded in purple, we had 3,597 graduates from the BPS class of 2009, 2,430 enrolled, which is a enrollment rate, first year enrollment rate of 67.6%. So over two, two in every three, two thirds of the students enrolled within that first year. Now why that's important is that that's up uh, quite a bit. Even from class of 2008, you'll see 67.6% versus 63.6%. And then back to class of 2005, where we had 61% were in their first year. So when you think of Success Boston, Getting ready, getting in, and getting through the early, the early pillars of the initiative, this shows more getting in. Um, and as a result, in order to hit your 52% goal, you got to graduate a lot more students. So that's what this next slide will show. Paul, uh, as Paul mentioned, class of 2009, the far right bar, we reached 51.3%. Just shy of our of our of our um, the the goal we set. My calculator does not round up to 52 when he got 51.3, so I had to leave it there. But when you notice, when you look back, the key thing here is it, uh, one of the reasons why this is good news is when you look back at where we were, class of 2000, when we went back and rebenchmarked the class of 2000 to get on this first year enrollee scale, the new rate was 40.6 percent. So we're up 10.7 percentage points from that baseline year. It's a relative gain of, of 26 percent. So 51.3 percent since we started the series going back to 2000. That's the highest first uh, highest six year completion rate for first year enrollees that we've had. Now it's natural also ask, well, how, what about the entire high school class? So we do that as well in the in the study, and this shows you through six years what what percent of the high school graduating class completed a college degree. And you'll see on the far right hand side, 36.5% of the class of 2009 earned a degree. That's up almost 12 percentage points from class of 2000 when only one in four did. That was one of the key findings of getting to the finish line. One in four com com completed within six years. We're now up almost 50% on a relative basis, 12 points over the 24. And what that leads to is, is, what, is, is exactly what Paul opened up with. We have now have 1,314 graduates from the, from the BPS class of 2009 through six years, that's 579 more than where we were at the same point in time for class of 2000. That, to, that is the cumulative effect of enrolling more students and increasing college completion over, over time. Now, to put this in perspective, I just want to show you what's happened nationally since, since we began these studies back in 2000. So this, this chart just shows the six-year college graduation rates for first-time, full-time, bachelor degree-seeking students in the entire country. And, we, and you'll see, back in 2000, the completion rate for, for those uh, seeking a bachelor's degree after six years was 57.5%. Through 2008, the most recent year available, 
we're up to 59.6%. If I showed you two-year two -year colleges, there's a slight decline. So on net, there's, about, there's stagnation really across the country in college completion over the last decade. So when you, when you take a look at what we've been able to achieve here and here, it shows you that Boston is, is, is reversing what's happened nationally. Now another way to look at that is we, through the National Student Clearinghouse now provides a rich data source for us. We can compare how Boston does to um, a, a national cohort of, of, those, uh, of those enrolling in college right after high school. And that's what I did here. So on this measure, I look at just our immediate fall enrollees from the class of 2009. And if you look at the class of 2009, through six years, those BPS graduates that enrolled in the immediate fall, the fall 2009, we're now up to 54.7% completed versus 58.6% of those first-time enrollees nationally, which is a difference of just under four, uh, uh, four, four percentage points. And you'll see that nationally the, is the gray bar there. There's actually been a dip from 2007 through 2009. In Boston, we dipped in 2008, but now we're up to 54.7% on this measure. It's also the highest that Boston has, has, has achieved on this fall, fall enrolling measure. Now lastly, what explains what's happened nationally? Because there has been this dip, and as you see, there's a dip, dip in this chart on the gray bars. And a lot of this, you know, a lot of researchers have commented this is probably due to the Great Recession as well, because these, these college enrollees were enrolling at a time of, of, of a, a deep economic recession. But what is also true is, is that um, there, there's, there's been disparities in, in, in college completion, and the disparities have widened between those from low-income families nationally and those from high-income families. So I just selected a, a, a slide here that many may have probably seen from Robert Putnam's book, Our Kids. In fact, Robert Putnam shared it here at a forum at the Boston Foundation uh, last year. But what this shows is, they, in, in the U.S., we've tracked 10th graders, the 10th graders that were in the 10th grade in 2002, and we tracked them through 2012. So that's eight years after their expected high school graduation. And we, we put them in two family types. On the left-hand side, those, with, those from low family socioeconomic status. That's what the SES stands for. It's based on family income, parents' education. And then we looked at those in the high family socioeconomic status. And the bars represent how these students scored on their math test scores. So there's two family types, and you could score in, in, one of four, in, in, a, in, in, in four different areas on, on, on the math test, so it's a quartile distribution. What you see here is that those from the high family background, 74% that had the, that score on the highest, highest quartile of the math test, 74% completed college. It's almost a sure bet. Three of every four 10th graders in 2002 that, that came from a high family, uh, high family SES and scored high in their math test completed college by 2012. On the other side, the low family, it's only 41%. Same, the only difference between these two groups of students, one is from a low family SES, the others are from, from high family. Their gray bars, the test score is exactly the same. The difference is 33 percentage points. This is one of the key reasons why Robert Putnam said the American dream is in crisis. Test scores, test scores alone do not explain the difference. Family income is playing a much bigger role in college completion. Now, when I, that, that's, that's an, an overriding thing that's, gonna, that's, that's a national phenomenon. It's true in Boston as well. So let me take you through um, the, the demographics of our, of, our, uh, of our class of 2009 graduates. So as we mentioned, this is, again, is a first year enrolling measure. So we had 51.3% of the class of 2009 had completed. When you look at across gender and race, females are at 58, males are at 42. That's a difference here of almost 16 percentage points, 15.6 points. If you just look at the number of female college grads to male college grads, it's 1.8 to 1 is the ratio. 180 female grads for every 100 males. Now across race et ethnicity, the gap from the, the, the lowest group, uh, which, which is black students from the class of 2009, compared to the highest group is about 33 points, black at 42, Asian at 75%. So there are, there are gender and race ethnic disparities in, in, in the results. When you, t when you look at the intersection of gender and race, you see that from the high end at Asian females, an 83% six-year completion rate for first-year enrollees, and on the low end for black and Hispanic males is at 31 and 34%. Across the board from top to bottom, almost 53 points. However, the, the promising news here is we went back, because we have this body of knowledge, and looked at where were we at the class of 2005. So on this measure, I just looked at all, all high school graduates, 
how many completed college within six years and broke it out by gender and race, seven of the eight groups here increased their completion rate. The one group that didn't, white males. White males had a slight dip. But the gains for black females and Hispanic females are quite large, and the gains are also, were also considerable on a relative basis for Hispanic and black males. So overall, we've, we've shown progress in, 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 in increasing the rates of seven of the eight groups, and as a result, we've narrowed slightly the, the gaps between white and Hispanic students and, and, white and, and white and black students as well. Now, just lastly, we track all the BPS graduates through, through uh, college based on wh wh what type of college that they go to. Now, when you interpret these findings, you have to look at them cautiously. This is not meant to be a compar comparative evaluation of two-year public, four-year private, and four-year public colleges. All this is telling us is what are the completion rates of BPS graduates based on where they go to college. And for two-year public schools, which are primarily open admission here in Boston, we had 187 college graduates out of 738 enrollees, completion rate of 25%. As I'll show you, that's actually a big increase from where we were back in 2000 and, and, and 2005 as well. Among four-year private, the completion rate is 62.6%. It's almost exactly the same for four-year public colleges as, as well. Now, as I mentioned, we compare this to the past. And for the class of 2005, I went back and replicated the analysis that was done in getting closer to the finish line by Andy Sum and his team. And we look at, to do that, I have to look at inactive enrollees. So I'm looking at the six-year graduation rates of all inactive enrollees. And what do we mean by inactive enrollees? We mean that you either graduated or you're no longer enrolled. So we look at graduates over that, over that group. It's graduates over graduates plus those that are no longer enrolled. If you're still enrolled, we take, we take you out of the equation because you're still working towards your degree. What you find here is on the far left, for two-year public schools, the completion rate for class of 2005 was 15.8%. That's what we reported in getting closer to the finish line. We're now up to 26%, 10 percentage point gain. On a relative basis, it's a 66% increase over class of 2005. For four-year public, we're up, we're, we're up uh, several percentage points as well in four-year private. But across the board, each sector, the completion rates have increased uh, uh, quite substantially since 2005. So it's another sign that we have, we have, we have been making considerable progress. Now, many of these students that are in these two-year and four-year public, particularly two-year public and four-year public, have been coached. So a lot of the gains we'll, 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 see, we'll see show up in the, in, in the next presentation as well. Now, just to conclude, why, why, there's a lot of good news here, as Paul mentioned, but there are also important challenges. President Obama, I think, said it best in his 2015 radio address when he said, in an economy increasingly built on innovation, the most important skill you can sell is your knowledge. That's why higher education is more than ever the surest ticket to a middle class. That couldn't be more true, more, more, more true in greater Boston. That's why continuous improvement on these measures and continuing to track them is so important. It takes cross-sector collaborations to address the income gaps that I showed you on completion rates and a lot of the gender and race ethnic disparities as well. It's going to take the work of all of us. It's also going to take targeted interventions, and particularly targeting those that are at the greatest risk of completing. With that, I'll turn it over to Tamara because she has uh, s some important findings on what we're learning about our coaching program. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out this afternoon. So as Joe mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, what actually happened with the students who received coaching under the Success Boston program um, from the class of 2009. So the key questions that I'm going to answer are, um, OK, <laughs> starting again. All right. So the key questions that I'm going to answer today are, um, what was the college enrollment and the college completion rate of the students who received a Success Boston coach from the class of 2009? And how did those rates compare to the BPS graduates from the class of 2009 who did not participate in Success Boston coaching? And then also, I'll dig a little deeper and look at how the rates vary by, by key student and institutional characteristics, so by um, a student's gender, race, as well as um, the high school that they came from and the college that they ended up attending. So very similar uh, to Joe's approach, 
we use the same data that he's using. So we're looking at the National Student Clearinghouse records um, that are collected by the Boston Public Schools to look at enrollment and completion. But we're actually also using um, the Success Boston Salesforce database to identify students that participated in the coaching program. So students that participate in coaching have a one-on-one -on -one coach who provides various supports to them from the end of high school through um, the first two years in college for the class of 2009. Um, they may provide some support in terms of navigating the college registration process, understanding financial aid, how to find funding, as well as helping select courses to take, uh, get students on a clear path to graduation, um, among other, other personal and life issues that, that students may need. And so those students from the class of 2009 made, uh, were about 7% 7, 7 of the entire graduating class had a coach that provided those supports. Um, so we're talking about, a, a, in 2009, a fairly small, small slice of the overall um, graduating class. As Paul mentioned, that, that slice has expanded dramatically um, six, years, six years later. Um, till, till now where there are about a thousand students this year that are receiving a coach. Um, but this, this is the, the, first, the first year. So who are the students that received a coach? Um, you can see that the red lines here are the students who received a coach and the gray bar are the students from the BPS class um, of 2008 who did not participate in coaching. And so you can see that there are some, some demographic differences as well as differences in where students went to high school, graduated from high school. So Success Boston coaches do target students that are underrepresented in, um, in our higher education system. And so um, luckily, they are reaching those students. And over 80% of the coach students from the class of 2009 were black or Hispanic. There are um, slightly more female students that had a coach that did not have a coach. And there are also more students that graduated from traditional high schools in traditional Boston public high schools than from the exam or the pilot schools. So that's who the students are, and they're a little bit different than the overarching class of 2009. So there are more um, black and Hispanic students who participated in coaching. There are more female students, and there, again, are more students um, from the traditional public schools than, than one would expect if um, the coaches took a cross-section of the BPS graduating class. So this is important because I want to um, just spend one minute to, to really reiterate that this is a descriptive report right now. And so we're presenting the rates and want to see what's happened to the class of 2009. But we're not able to make any causal claims um, that the coaching was, in fact, what caused the graduation rates to increase. Uh, as Paul and Joe have, have, have listed out, there have been a lot of things that have happened and a huge effort that's been made um, to improve the college outcomes for BPS students. And so today, we're presenting the comparative rates for students who didn't, didn't, didn't participate in coaching, but really um, to provide a frame of reference to understand how the coaching students fared, as opposed to saying um, that you know, coaching was, was the 100% uh, cause of, of any differences that we see. There may be systematic differences other than just the demographic differences that I showed you that are related to both participation in coaching as well as college outcomes. For example, academic skills um, or students' motivation to complete college. We are currently involved in uh, or conducting a rigorous evaluation that will use some more sophisticated statistical techniques to identify uh, a comparison group for the coach students um, who participated in from the classes of 2013 and 14. And that report will be coming out in early 17 and will be able to um, better estimate the effect of coaching on college outcomes for BPS graduates. So with that, um, I'll jump into the results. So this first slide is about how many students enrolled in college. And so you can see um, that students who participated in coaching, and here I have that abbreviated as SBC, um, are more likely to enroll in, in college um, than their BPS counterparts who did not participate in coaching. These are the four different definitions of enrollment. You can see that 80% of the coach students enrolled in college right after high school. So that's in the fall. Um, so this would be the fall of 2009. If you go up down the, down the chart, uh, more and more students enroll over time with the end result of almost 92% of the coach students enrolling in college at some point. Um, and for BPS, 
The numbers are a bit are a bit lower overall, starting out at 58.6 and ending um, ever at 79% of the students who didn't receive a coach at some point between 2009 and 2015 enrolled in college. So where do they enroll? The green bars here are students who enrolled first at a four-year college, purple are first at a two-year college, and then blue is did not ever enroll. So you can see that the purple bar for the students who participate in coaching is much larger than the purple bar for the students who did not, showing that many more of the students who participated in coaching were first enrolled at a two-year institution. The rates for four-year institutions are, are pretty much the same for students who participated in coaching and those who didn't. That has implications for what we expect to see in terms of outcomes. So who actually ended up graduating after six years? So the gray bar, again, is students who, the BPS graduates who did not have a coach and red are BPS graduates who did have a coach. And you see that the red bar is slightly lower um, than, than the gray bar here. So 52.4% of the coach students who immediately enrolled in college had graduated with at least a, some credential or degree within six years and 54.9% of the BPS graduates who did not have a coach had graduated. If you can see the really faint gray line um, shows the national average just to give some comparison here and that is 58.6% uh, for, um, for, for students who enrolled immediately after high school. And so we do see that the coach students and the BPS grads overall are a little bit lower than the national average here. Um, as I mentioned though, the students who participated in coaching are much more likely or enroll at higher rates at two-year colleges where as Joe showed, um, the the college graduation rates tend to be a bit lower. Um, so I wanna dig in a little bit more to, to these results so we can really see what's, what's going on with the coach students. So here, I'm gonna presenting the results that are broken down by both gender and race and ethnicity. So the one section are for male students and the second is for females. So kind of at first glance, you can see Overar overarchingly, the female students across the board are performing, are graduating at higher rates than male students are. If we jump into the male bars, you can see that the red bar again indicating the coach students for black males is quite a bit larger than the gray bar for black males that represents the BPS grads who did not participate in coaching. The Hispanic bars, um, the coach students, coached Hispanic male students graduated at slightly lower rate than their counterparts who did not participate in coaching. For Asian students and white students, the BPS graduates who didn't participate in coaching are a bit, um, are, doing, are doing better. The, the one caveat here is that, as I mentioned, over 80% of the coach students are black and Hispanic students. So when we start breaking down into uh, gender and race, ethnicity, and coach or not coach, we're getting into fairly small ends here. So just as a, as a cautionary tale there, there are only 12 white male students who received a coach from the class of 2009. So I don't want anyone to walk away here um, with taking, putting too much stock in the, the rate for 12 students, but I did want to show you the, the race and gender breakdowns across, across the board, especially because um, when, you're, when you're looking at the BPS grads, there are obviously more than 12 white male um, graduates from the class of 2009. And then when we hop over to the female side of the chart, you can see that both black and Hispanic females who received coaches graduated at slightly higher rates than BPS graduates who did not have a coach, and for Asian and white female students, their graduation rates are just slightly lower if you had a coach. Now we're gonna look at where the students actually enrolled in college. And as I mentioned um, from what, what Joe's presentation, two-year colleges generally, um, in this case, the students who enrolled in the two-year colleges have a lower completion rate. However, you can see that for students who had a coach at the two-year colleges, their completion rate was actually um, higher by almost about 10 percentage points than the BPS graduates who did not have a coach. So going to a two-year college and having a coach, you're like chances of getting out are about a third, or a third of them got out of college within six years, whereas only about a quarter of students who did not have a coach graduated within six years. The, um, the four-year college graduation rates are, are very similar for the coached and the non-coached students. 
so to break it down a little bit further, I'm going to present some data that looks just at the colleges that enrolled the majority of the coached students. So as I've mentioned a couple times here, um, you know, the, the coaching is targeted at particular students, those that are underrepresented um, in the post-secondary or post-secondary institutions. And so those students are not going to, um, you know, equally to the, the same colleges um, that uh, uh, the entire group of BPS graduates or a nationally representative sample. And so we can see um, through the two-year findings that there seem to be some differences when we're looking at particular, um, particular types of colleges and particular students um, who, are, who are coached relative to their peers who are not coached. So these seven colleges that I have listed here, Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology, Bridgewater State, Bunker Hill Community College, Northeastern University, Roxbury Community College, Suffolk University, and University of Massachusetts Boston enrolled over 80% of the students who received a coach in this year. So this is these are the institutions where they um, are most likely to be enrolled. Whereas if you look at their counterparts from BPS who did not enroll, who did not have a coach, only just over 40% of those students went to these colleges. So the coach students and the non-coach students are going to different colleges. So that's one clear clear difference here in these results. So let's see how they fare at the colleges. Um, again, where the coach students are going. So here you can see a real, um, a real uh, shining, a potential shining moment for the coach students in that at those seven institutions, almost half of the coach students, 49.3%, had graduated within six years, whereas students who did not receive a coach at these same institutions, their graduation rate was 38.5%. So this could mean that, that coaching is really having a positive impact on the graduation rates for students um, at, these, at these colleges. And so looking also at these colleges and looking now again at the gender and racial breakdowns, you see that across all of the gender racial breakdowns except for, um, except for white males, the students who received a coach at these seven colleges graduated at a higher rate than students who did not receive a coach. So again, the black, um, the largest difference here is for black males, um, similar to what we saw for the overall grad rates, but here um, a, a really substantial difference here, just over 50% of black male students at these seven colleges who had a coach graduated within six years, and just over 20% of their counterparts who did not have a coach at these colleges graduated within six years. For the female students across all gender and racial groups, female students who had a coach at these seven colleges graduated at higher rates than their counterparts who did not have a coach. So these are potentially um, you know, promising results for, for the coaching effort. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we're going to continue to follow them and, and continue this, this look at the effect of coaching. In addition to looking at the effect of coaching, I want to also mention that in addition to students that have completed, there are also a substantial number of students who are coached and who are not coached who are still enrolled in college and have yet to complete any degree by the end of six years. So, Almost 20%, 18% of the coach students were enrolled without a completion in 2014-15 school year, which is six years later. And about 14.3% of the non-coach students were still enrolled without a completion. So there are more coach students that are still enrolled. Um, and if we are to track this group of students from the class of 2009 into the future years, those completion rates in general, in general may, um, may, may rise further. So as I mentioned, there are additional, additional work is being done that's focused on uh, sub subsequent cohorts of the coach students, the class of 2013 and 14. And so we're going to use a technique called propensity score matching where we're able to isolate comparable students to the coach students um, across a whole host of characteristics, not just gender and race and um, high school attended, but also looking at um, kind of you know, key, key variable that Joe mentioned, which is um, SES looking at some motivational characteristics, looking at other, um, other experiences that these students had in high school to, to really be able to isolate the effects um, of coaching and determine if coaching has an impact not only on persistence but also on achievement um, in college, completion of the FAFSA, the, and also credit accumulation. So as I, as I noted, there are more students that are still enrolled that haven't finished yet. So are the coach, coach students accumulating more credits at a faster rate or over um, a more consistent time period than students who did not complete? And then eventually, we'll actually, we will be following the classes of 2013, 14 um, through to their, their college graduation as well. And that's it.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Pauley. I'm a senior director here at the Boston Foundation. And I think if there's one thing I have learned since we launched Success Boston, it's that improving post-secondary success is a complex challenge that demands a strong partnership across sectors in order to ad be addressed. And Success Boston is a partnership. It is the citywide partnership that works to get students ready in and through college and then connected to careers. So we have put together a panel for you that represents the component parts of this work that is working on the academic and non-academic preparation, the transition into college, the supports once they get to campuses, and the partnership with the employer community. So at this point, I'd like to invite the panelists to join me on stage, and we'll dive right in to the conversation. So panelists, would you please join me? Uh, there is, as you can see, uh, an all-star panel, one of the largest ever, um, and their uh, accomplishments are many. So you, you can read in depth about each of our panelists on your um, chairs. There were bios. I will offer them just a brief introduction um, and shortchange them all, I'm certain, uh, by not sharing all of the many wonderful things that they have done. Uh, immediately to my right, representing uh, Mayor Martin J. Walsh, is Teron Dorsey, who is the Chief of Education for the City of Boston and an active participant representing the convener of Success Boston. Next to Ron is Paul Grogan, the president and CEO of the Boston Foundation, who represents the nonprofit community in our partnership and the getting in uh, component of our work. Next to Paul is um, Keith Motley, who is the chancellor of UMass Boston and who convenes the higher ed community in partnership with one of our other co-chairs for the getting through component of Success Boston. Uh, next to Chancellor Motley is Tommy Chang, the superintendent of the Boston Public Schools, who is charged with the getting ready component of the work. Uh, next to Tommy is Pam Edinger, the president of Bunker Hill Community College, who, along with Chancellor Motley, co-chairs the higher ed community on the getting through work. And finally, next to Pam, we have Ken Montgomery, who is the first vice president and chief operating officer at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, and he is also the chair of the Boston Private Industry Council, the city's workforce development board, and Ken oversees our getting connected work. So together, these are our co-chairs and our fearless leaders in the Success Boston Partnership. Um, and so I will ask them all, what did you find the most striking? And Ron, I'm actually gonna start with you and we'll go right down the line for what were the most striking findings that you heard today? Sure, good afternoon. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Good, thank you for being here. Uh, I think we've got a lot of exciting news. First, I want to start out by saying that the, the mayor is a proud partner in Success Boston and is very excited about the results today. Um, I have a list of things that I'm excited about and I could probably steal all your points, but I won't do it. Um, I think three things come to mind. Uh, first of all, that we are measurably and consistently moving the needle on completion just has to be recognized. I think buried in that fact is that we're actually getting a lot more students to post-secondary opportunities. And in BPS, we're talking about between two-thirds and three-quarters of students entering uh, post-secondary opportunities. And I think that's a huge testament to the work and the continuous improvement of the Boston public school system. So that's often not recognized, but should be recognized. Secondly, the coaching findings uh, suggest that we're learning a lot about where and to whom we should be targeting uh, coaching. So I'm a recovering policy researcher and a former APT associate, so uh, I won't go too far with causality and impact and all of that good stuff, but uh, we have a next set of great questions to pursue in the research to really figure out what's potent about uh, coaching and where is coaching most potent. I think I'm encouraged that at the seven uh, highest enrolling schools, we are seeing a differential rate of success uh, related to coaching. So it tells me something about what we should be asking about their ability to institutionalize coaching, how they're thinking about student supports uh, as well. So they have a lot to teach us about how to build and scale the work. Lastly, there are gender and race disparities that we should all be concerned about. And so I hope that this popped out in the research to you as well. There are some promising things in there, particularly for black males, that I'm very encouraged by. But if you look uh, relatively speaking, we're talking about low 
low rates of completion even for those who were coached. And so there's work to do here, but I think having this kind of data that helps us pinpoint equity opportunities will help us go deeper for the students who need it most. Well, I guess my uh, dominant reaction is that this tells us that this can be done. Uh, amid a general attitude, I think, in, in, uh, uh, in society that uh, the uh, divides can't be healed, that uh, you know, we really don't know what to do about uh, uh, poverty, et cetera. Here's a case where we picked out a lever that we thought could be particularly powerful in advancing the opportunities for these young people, uh, and we have executed a major uh, rather implausible, I would say, <laughs> uh, uh, improvement in the, uh, in the results. So success is important in things as difficult as this, and uh, I hope this really charges us up uh, again to, to go uh, further down the road and, and get even the better results. And, of course, Mayor Menino's ultimate goal for us was 70 percent, which uh, would be astounding uh, if we reached that for the class of 2011. But it's good to have a stretch goal out there uh, uh, to keep us going. The other thing that uh, struck me about it, and, and I, I mentioned the being on the radio with uh, uh, Danny Noel, who I think is here, one of the coaches. I'm, Danny, stand up, would you? There he is, right there. <laughs> Danny and I were on, were on the radio the other day together, and I, w I was stunned by, in a way, the simplicity of what's been done here to supply these young people with someone to go to. I, I even thought of the old, the great Gershwin song, Someone to Watch Over Me. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, almost apart from the specifics of what goes on and what problems they solve, having that resource, much as you know, middle and upper middle class children have a family resource because their parents went to, went to college and, and they know what it's about and they can provide that assistance, these young people are, are, uh, are first time college goers from their families uh, through no fault of their own. They don't have that kind of backup and, and resource that more affluent families have. And uh, so I, I just think it was, uh, a kind of genius to seize on this simple thing as not the whole picture, not everything we're doing, but, but a, a critical, critical element of the success that is unfolding here. So Danny is who you let take my place the other day, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm so proud of that. I mean, that's so appropriate. And congratulations to you and all the other coaches and everyone else who's part of the working group. He is a great Who's out here. Oh, I wanted you to say that. I didn't want to have to say that, <laughs> that myself. That's why I'm so proud he took my place. So you can <laughs> sort of say that. But I, talking of, of changing places, I think it's uh, really good to sit here as one of the institutional storytellers among this group and see that we were wise enough to come together and develop a co-chair kind of model that included all of the entities, and it's great to have the sustained leadership that I see and in, in the great leadership that I see and in innovative thinking that comes from the talent that is here and all around this room. And so thank you for that. I am so proud of all the sectors. You know, when I think about our higher education ecosystem in um, this capital city, what a wonderful place to be. When you have private institutions that understood this, First of all, we didn't, um, the, the natural finger pointing, I think that was sort of uh, part of your, one of the presentations I heard earlier, uh, didn't happen. We sort of centered it in our students and what that success might look like and went to work. Yes, there were stretch goals, but we also didn't get caught up in this notion of the academy that says that this is such a slow process, so accept that as well. We sort of balanced that. So the privates were able to increase um, their persistence and completion rates and went from 64 to 68 or something of that nature. All of our colleagues in our two-year institutions were able to do the same um, and, and move that needle in a way that was tremendous in terms of getting to their numbers. But also our four-year institutions that happened to be public moved that needle. And as I looked at our institution and went back to 2000 and saw that we were at an abysmal 25% and moving that number close to 63% has been a wonderful journey for us and we were able to do it without that normal. Oh well, you know, 
One hundred percent is the goal. So I don't want you to. I don't want you to think that that you know. But for and is for institutions, particularly in a great place like this, with great systems like we have in place, not to have the kind of conversations and not to try to do the kind of linkages that make a difference for those students. It would just be uh, crazy not to do that. And so to have this opportunity and to evolve as institutions has been amazing. So yes, the mayor said a 70%, and this mayor is holding us to tremendously high standards as well. However, our goal is 100%. So they're giving us a minus 30, and we're just, you know, uh, we'll acknowledge that as we sort of move forward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So so I, I agree with my colleagues. There is so much to be hopeful and uh, hopeful for in this report. A lot for us to think about, a lot for us to double down on. Um, and as a newbie in this group, as someone who is fairly new to Boston, it is also very reassuring to see that uh, there is work that happens across sectors because often we joke that hurting a cats is difficult, but when we do come together, it, can lead to very powerful results. I do want to, uh, I do want to double down again on what something Ron said. There are some gender um, and race disparities we need to under try to understand even more. And I want to call out uh, the male-female disparity, and in particular the Latino, um, Latino uh, disparity, the Latino male disparity. Smaller percentage are enrolling, smaller percentage are completing, and uh, smaller effect of coaching. And that community is 40% of Boston Public Schools. At this time, it is our largest subgroup of students, and they are the ones that are doing the worst. And so, just want to call that out. Good afternoon, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I can no longer say that I'm the newbie because Tommy's sitting next to me. <laughs> so the gloss is off, it's just truth now. Um, part of what struck me as I read this report is everything that folks have said, but, but unless you work in higher ed, um, it's really difficult to, to explain to someone what a double digit gain means. It almost never happens in the higher ed landscape because it is so, it is so vast and public higher ed is so very and complex. So you have a lot more low-income students and students all across the different race and ethnicities. So, so I, want to, I want to point to that double-digit number and, and to let you know that we are unusual, if not unique, across the United States. The other piece that really struck me is the concept of coaching. As we're moving into um, scaling up what we're doing to a thousand students and so on, I'm seeing um, students outside of BPS who are getting internal coaching from, from the community college because we knew that it was a promising practice. So we have the control group of the Boston students, but we have other districts with students coming to us that we're, that we're doing the same thing with. And we're seeing concordance in that growth. So, so the validation of that practice is not only within the Boston system, and it's within our greater Boston system, but I'm also looking at studies across the United States that's pointing to coaching as the real needle mover. So um, I'm happy to you know, see the, the, the Greater Boston um, institutions leading that work, but what I don't see in some of the, in some of the national um, work is the kind of partnerships that we have here. The, the true cross-sector partnerships between the city, the state, you know, the nonprofits, and and and, and the four and, and, and two-year, um, and the business and the um, and the K-12 sector, that truly is unique to Boston. And I and I think those double digits will will, will go up some more. And a hundred, we're trying for a hundred, right, Keith? That's right. And there you go. The chancellor says so, and so it shall be. <laughs> So I look at this from the perspective of an employer, and I see this as a workforce development success story. Graduating twice as many people from 2009, 2000 is a huge success story. So as we look at it, certainly I have focused on the diversity that several of the panelists have mentioned, but we also see it as an opportunity to get people that work in our city that represent the environment, represent the people that they're supporting for all of these activities. So we saw it as a, a very ups, upbeat message. 
I do, as I said earlier, have the concerns about minority advancement in, in terms of this, and I really hope coaching and a focus on coaching for some of those cohorts will have additional benefit. Well, thank you all. Um, the way I'd like to organize our conversation with the co-chairs is first to look back at what we think the report tells us and what our experience has been, and then to look ahead. For those of you, by the way, who are tweeters, you can tweet at hashtag SuccessBoston, and we will be taking questions later from Twitter if, um, if you're tweeting. So I, I think first what I'd like to dig into um, uh, as some of our panelists alluded to, Ron, um, you mentioned this, um, but I'm, I'm actually gonna now direct it to Chancellor Motley. What should we be celebrating? There's a lot of, in here. There's good news, there's mixed news, there might be some bad news. What are the things we really should be celebrating and elevating? Well, one of the things I'm celebrating is the fact that you were able to get 37 higher education institutions to the same table <laughs> to try to work on some issue. I mean, right in this very room, um, not so long ago on a Friday before the 4th of July holiday that happened because it was about the students in their development. So we could table all of the rest of it. And so that discussion talked about not only how we were going to uh, work together to sort of increase the enrollment of the students that happened to be Boston public students, but and others who happen to come from Boston. But we got into all the elements of how we could put together systems that were effective and worked, and that no one could be the one who had to just own that excellence. We could share it, and we could all own it. And I think the, the greatest thing we did was establish working groups that would begin to think about that at a level of working with those um, individuals and then this notion of completion and moving on to wonderful opportunities was on the horizon for them and how we sort of, you know, develop that going forward. But those opportunities to develop this embedded model of coaching, which makes a lot of sense, having someone who has been with these um, students in a pre-collegiate kind of way and then bringing them onto our campuses, which is unheard of, if you know the higher education community. Someone else coming in, doing something that I may think that I should be doing is very hard, but when you center it in students, all that goes away. As, you know, it, it leaves. So I was so grateful for that. So this notion of learning uh, outcomes, this, no this notion of advising in an effective way, all these kinds of things uh, leading to experiential learning, but then outcomes that work that have some kind of economic implications for these students, that we could hang over them at the end that become real for them has been an amazing part of that journey. But I reflect back to this day. Uh, we were, you know, sometimes you have to, when you're convening something, you hope folks show up. <laughs> but they came. And then it was like, now what? <laughs> and so fortunately having this collective and that collective out there, we were able to um, pull that together. Thank you. Pam, representing the community colleges, what do you see on campus that might be driving some of these double digit gains that the um, Chancellor just referenced? I think it's a it's a it's a more cohesive narrative, right? Now now it is no longer, as Chancellor Motley said, an anomaly to say, well, you go here for two years and, and, and you get ready and you and you go to UMass Boston. There are days that I really want to call up Chancellor Motley and say, put me on your payroll because I'm not working for you. <laughs> but he's right, when you're focusing on the students, that really works. Uh, one observation that I have is that our funnel is wider now because there are more students coming to college and they are coming more ready. So if we're receiving more students and we don't see a drop in their performance but instead seeing a gain, to me that's a reflection on the better preparation on the K-12 end. And the curricular alignment that we're doing makes a huge difference. Just like we aligned the curriculum, we're now also aligning the coaching conversations. Um, being to, th that restoration of privilege really starts with the coaching in, in the high school and we carry on that narrative into our internal coaching. Um, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot to take in um, in understanding that it's not just one thing that flips the switch. That flipping the switch 
in, um, in the superintendent's um, area of responsibility really sets it up for all of us. So I think that that coordination is really important to note. Great. Um, and before we go, I, uh, Superintendent Chang, I, I'm going to come to you in a minute to talk about, as we look ahead, how do we ensure that ever more students go on to a diverse set of post-secondary options prepared to succeed? But before we do that, Paul, I wanted to come to you to have you tell us a little bit about coaching, what it has looked like, where it's going, what it might look like, and really what it is. Well, I think we need to gather uh, a lot more information uh, about uh, the various problems that, that people have dealt with and, uh, um, uh, and all that uh, so that we can be much more scientific about what the coaching has meant. But I'll go back to what I said uh, earlier, that uh, there's something about the simplicity of this uh, that uh, apparently uh, is having a very large uh, impact. And so one of the things that we should continue to try to do, even though we've had this enormous success with the Social Innovation Fund grant that is allowing us to go from 300 uh, uh, students to 1,000, uh, that's, that's half of the BPS graduates who are enrolling in college are going to have a coach now at the higher level. But uh, why, not, why not all of them? Why, why shouldn't we find the resources, given what we're learning here, and given the payoff uh, the return on investment of college completion, uh, Andy Sum did a little bit of work on this before he uh, retired, but, but it's huge. And, you know, you think about earnings, taxes paid, civic engagement, uh, college graduates are much healthier and live longer. Uh, you know, the, 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 co the correlations with desirable uh, outcomes are, are enormous. And so there's a lot that goes into this besides the coaching. Uh, and t Tommy knows this. I mean, the, the, the BPS is, has st started and is continuing to improve the, the rigor of the high school curriculum. And that's very important. Something we haven't mentioned yet is the, the number of Boston students needing remediation declined uh, very significantly from the mid-40s to the mid-30s. Now, we've got to do even better than that. But again, another double-digit uh, uh, change in the, uh, uh, in the right direction. Um, the other thing I want to mention about the coaching is that, um, you know, Jim Browder asked uh, Danny Noel, the, the coach who appeared with me on this program, uh, aren't there some kids who don't want you? Aren't there kids who just say, I don't need this? And Danny said, no. <laughs> I, have, I haven't met that, that kid yet. There's an eagerness for help and support, a receptivity that I think is another thing that has made this uh, work uh, with great effect. Thank you. So building on that, how, how Superintendent Chang, do we ensure that more students are ready, that they arrive on our partner campuses more ready for success, that they're choosing from a diverse set of pathways, uh, and that we're, we're getting more kids on the right track? So Paul, Paul's right. Uh, it's great to hear that we are preparing our young people for college. We're better preparing them for college and career and life. Um, it's about making sure that the, what we're teaching, what young people are learning, is standards align. Um, as, we, as this country moves to the Common Core, wherever what state wants to call it, it is about college and career readiness standards. And those college readiness standards are being a lot more aligned with the SATs, the APs, preparation for college. And that alignment is really important for us as a country. And so we're doing better on that. And, Having curriculum as both rigorous and uh, relevant is important. I think number two, um, our young people are also getting used to uh, coaching as being an accepted part of the K-12 sector. So um, great to have uh, many partners that are providing coaches to help tutor students, um, help address issues around chronic absenteeism, um, these are, our young people are having coaches in their lives from a very young age. Actually, actually there's an example of one school, the Perkins, which is a school in South Boston. It's part of the M our MBK initiative, and they're piloting uh, mentorship to address chronic absenteeism with first graders, kindergartners and first graders. Um, and I think the last thing is we're all, it's targeted support of schools that are massively low performing. 
we cannot accept schools which are um, that are, are dropout factors. We just can't accept it. And I, I think about the work that has happened at uh, the Burke and um, while last week we were very focused on a, a horrible tragedy that should never be accepted and normalized. Um, the Burke is a bright spot about the work in Boston Public Schools. It is. <laughs> Thank you. It is uh, is the only level four high school in the state of Massachusetts that has left level four status. Uh, incredible headmaster, incredible staff, incredible partners, all working together, and we're not accepting low performing uh, schools in the city. So, thank you. As we look ahead, one of the areas of growth for us that we need to do better on, Tommy, you referenced this. Um, Joe and Tamara also referenced it, is with young men and young men of color. And so of, um, maybe starting with Keith or Pam, is there something you've seen on campus that has been particularly successful in helping young men and young men of color enroll in, persist in, and complete college at higher rates that we should be looking at? Well, I, I think the first thing is, um, a paradigm shift from sort of making you feel demonized sometimes about just who you are to a new reality of that. And as someone who was given coaching but wasn't coachable at first, I was the kind of person who would go to a Danny and I would wait for him to leave at lunchtime and then I'd leave him a note. I was here, where were you? <laughs> <laughs> but then my, then my coach showed up to, they, we didn't call them coaches. We called them, some, we called them something else. And then what we called them when they weren't around was even something else. <laughs> but that person found their way to my room at 8 o'clock for an 8 o'clock class I was supposed to be at. And it was like, we're, I was there, where were you? And then I'm also going to tell some folks, your coach on the basketball court, your other people significant in your life to make a difference. So, you know, that's changing that paradigm for these students and change, shifting it from coaching being something that, you know, says that you're less than or that you're in a program that means that you're less than. This is why we talk about this as success Boston. Not something different from that. We talk about the excellence of the opportunity of higher education and then to have partners who are preparing students differently, who are also helping us to help them start on track and stay on track towards completion. But then completion to what? That's why when I look down here and see my partners from the Private Industry Council and others, when we start talking about completion to opportunity, that's a whole different kind of, of, of framework. Mm -hmm. You know, I know it's been said before, this notion of you, the, what's going, I, you know, I want all of our students to succeed. But when I'm looking at some of these young men, I'm looking at them and I'm seeing myself and remembering myself, and I know what their opportunity can be given the kind of support structures and systems that can make a difference. And so for us to be able to identify ways that we can get through to some of these, you saw even in those bars, coaching was making at least some kind of, someone paying attention and caring enough about you to say something to you about success. Not constantly chasing you because you're failing, that makes a tremendous difference. Reframes things for you. Now you don't want that person to be disappointed in you. And you know, that's, that goes back to you know, connecting that to some of the others, those people who cared about you all along on the way that you don't want that to happen. And I know that was what pushed me. And this, in some cases, we just have to remember that we weren't sitting up on a panel in these suits all of our lives. You know, we sort of had a process to get here. So connect your rhythms to some of those rhythms and try to understand where some of these folk are coming from. Because those people you're talking about are you. All of us in this room, they are us. Once we discover that, 
then there's this ethic of care, a culture that sort of, sort of expects that. But then trial and error in that is OK. If I'm not doing so good, let's figure out how to fix that. There's nothing more comforting to know that you have some place to go. We do it. Pam talked about talking to each other. When there's, we just talked about our tune-up. It's coming this summer. We tune each other up. Check our sparks plugs and all that, That's right. and then put ourselves back out to work for the next academic year. And she gave me a pass over the winter, but we're going to ready. Pass. I know we're getting ready to do it this summer. <laughs> so I mean, that's where that's how I sort of see that. Pam, I'm sorry, but you know they ask, so you get a little excited about this. <laughs> and that's why I love you. You know that, right? Yeah, I know. So you're back at you. <laughs> you know, part part of it is. Each one of us, whether we are men of color or women of color or Asians or, 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 or Southeast Asians or Latino, Latina, we just simply cannot, we simply have to say, this is not acceptable. <laughs> yeah. that, that's all there is right. to it. This is not acceptable. And also recognize the fact that there is no one simple solution, right? None of us drink Kool-Aid, all of us drink wine. We're all educators. We know how that works. Um, there, is, there, there is no one solution. And if someone comes and tells you, here's one solution, and it's going to work for everybody, you know they're selling snake oil because life doesn't work that way. So part of the solutions that we've developed at the college is to build that awareness and that self-reflection and all the things that Keith talked about into the curriculum. Because why do you come to college? You come to class. right? The curriculum is the heart of the learning. The restoration of privilege with coaching and every else, everything else brings you to the classroom. So unless you're building it into your curriculum, which is the backbone of the learning, it's never going to last and it's not going to be sustainable. So we have learning community seminars, which are our um, freshman seminar, but it has a theme. One of the uh, seminar topics is actually men of color. I mean, call it what it is. If we don't know what is going on and what is going wrong, well, ask, right? Ask the people who know. So I, we have faculty members who are running that uh, uh, learning seminar. And young men of color, as well as young women of color, um, and young women of Caucasian women and, and, and Latino women, men and women, they come and they learn about that particular topic and what makes the difference in these young men's lives. So um, I would encourage, and Paul said something earlier about being more rigorous in terms of what it means to coach. I think it's fine to throw out all kinds of initiatives, but unless you can figure out what exactly are the competencies within coaching and the competencies within a class like men of color, that makes the difference, then all we're doing is talking about it. Um, so I, I would suggest that our second round of work really is figuring out what are uh, what are the scientific and what are the um, empirical pieces um, that, that we have to touch, that we have to tweak in our curriculum and in our coaching to make it work. And it um, doesn't let anybody off the hook. It doesn't let anybody off the hook. Nobody. No one. It's, it's cultural not acceptable. competencies is across all of us. The curriculum of mm -hmm. inclusion is, is the answer. There are so many directions we could take this conversation. And Ken, I, I'd like to come to you in just a moment to get your perspective about how we best engage the employer community in this work so that we are, as the Chancellor said, connecting young people to opportunity. Before we do, though, we did get a question from Twitter that I think Pam speaks to exactly what you were just saying, so I'm going to inject it now, which is... Not going to pay them. <laughs> <laughs> what can teachers, counselors, administrators, and others learn from Success Boston coaches that they can apply across the K-12 through college continuum? And so since that came from Twitter, I'll direct that to anyone who wants to take a crack at it. It sounds like Danny, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, <laughs> we're so long, they're saying. Answering 130 characters. <laughs> Repeat the question. The question was, what, what can teachers, counselors, administrators, and others learn from Success Boston coaching that they can apply in K-12 and college? Um, I, I would think that persistence, consistency is what these folk need and um, that we need in our lives as, as young people. That there's some consistent um, pers person or persons that are going to constantly 
share the good and bad of your experience so that you can have those folk who are going to help you push along the way. I see so many starts and stops of this or that, and I think that's what we're talking about, Pam, sometimes when we talk about programs that we see on our campuses. Someone comes with a new idea all the time, only to find that it, it's not so new. It's just another version of something. So how do we connect that in, in those kinds of things? So. Yeah, I think something all of those characters in, in these children's lives can do is help create the expectation right. that uh, you will go and complete college or some other post-secondary opportunity. Uh, and here's where I think we can take a, a, a page from, uh, from the charter schools who I think have been particularly skillful at creating a new expectation for the children that they have that you will be going to college. And, and that's not one person saying that, that's the whole school reinforcing that all the time, reversing what it often was the previous expectation, which was there's no way I'm going to go to college. We can't afford it. Nobody, I don't know anybody who went to college, et cetera. Uh, so I think that's reversing that expectation and un unleashing uh, some latent ambition uh, in these children is uh, something everybody can help do. Tommy, did you want to jump in? I'll try to do it, and actually it's 140 characters. You're allowed 140 <laughs> characters. Oh. Um, sustain culture, cultural and linguistic identity with the young people. Yeah. That's what those coaches are doing. That's good. Ron, did you want to? I think I would add that um, I think we can all learn that young people benefit from having navigational capacity with them and somebody who offers some recourse uh, for them because we all hit points where we don't know what to do, we don't know where to go, we need an additional uh, amount of support. These folks on this panel provide that for me so I know young people <laughs> need that as well but I do want to caution because especially our teachers and instructors they're already doing this. They're trying to figure out how to navigate for their young people. They're all over the city and all over systems. It challenges them. I hear educators tell me, hard to do it all. So we need to kind of figure out how do we put the right guardrails on, give them the capacity and resource and wherewithal that they need to do it when they need to do it. But if it's additional capacity that's needed, either by investing in counselors or innovating some position or set of teammates that doesn't exist, we need to make that investment. So Ken, turning to you, how can we connect employers? How do we engage them in this conversation that will help students then connect to opportunity? You know, I think that we're, we're lucky being in Boston and that there's always been a, a strong commitment and leadership to youth in employment. And so as I look at the Boston Fed, for example, we've been part of the Boston Compact since, since origin. And over that period of time, have had high school interns for the summer, year-round interns, both high school and college, and hired a number of entry-level people right into to the Boston Fed. As we're looking and, and working at interns, one of the things that we want to do is introduce them to what does it take to work in two of the, the hottest industries in Boston, and that is finance and technology. Let them understand what it takes to have a career there. We recently have started to teach some of these students cybersecurity, of which there will be a million job openings in the next five years. So we think that by working with us, they can walk away with understanding basic principles, but also the education requirements to get a job in those industries that I described. We also see it on the, the flip side, and that is by working with these young people, we also see here's what's missing in terms of the skill set they need to be successful in the types of jobs we're talking about, but also in terms of those things they're going to need as they further their college education. As I look and talk to my colleagues uh, around Boston, they're talking about the same issues of how do we develop that workforce of the future? How do we explain to them what it really takes to get a position in these firms such that they can move up the, the ladder? I really liked Ron's comments earlier about the path to the middle class. If they understand these jobs, it will get them to, to the middle class. And this is an area that I think the PIC does a really good job of, is matching up employers with students and then working with both of them to understand what are their shared interests in terms of their career and their jobs. So I think that's what we have to do in terms of employers and the industry to stay connected with schools, 
organizations like the PIC, and then give students an opportunity to almost try and buy what their career is going to be. Thank you. As you can imagine, our co-chairs meetings are very interesting gatherings because we have these people all together around a table. Um, and that gives me great confidence that we can come together and find a way to 70% completion rate. But that said, I'm going to put a pause in this conversation because also important in Success Boston is student voice. And so we wanted to give the opportunity for a recent student who is a success story that can be claimed by himself his family, the Boston Public Schools, the nonprofit community, UMass Boston, uh, can all claim Manny Montero as a success story. And so we're going to invite him up. The panelists are going to stay. Um, Manny's going to share his perspective for a few minutes, and then we'll turn to Q&A. So Manny? I almost said good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if I take a sip of water, it's because my uh, mouth is getting dry, so. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with um, thank yous and um, who I represent while I'm up here today. Uh, thank you to the Boston Foundation um, for the invite um, for this platform for me to express my views and my perspective on Success Boston. Uh, thank you to Joan Becker for the email um, and the questions. Um, so I'm up here representing several different uh, institutions, several different groups. Um, I, can, I think I can say I represent the Boston Foundation now, right? <laughs> Mr. Grogan? <laughs> yes. I'm here representing the University of Massachusetts, Boston, uh, Chancellor Motley. Uh, specifically, um, Project REACH and the Talent Search Program, which I work for now. Um, I also represent the Africana Studies Department at UMass Boston. I represent uh, Freedom House, which is the um, organization that has supported me uh, since 2010 up until today, um, where I work and I part-time or per diem, and I also go there once in a while to get free food and <laughs> just engage in uh, just love, really. Um, I also represent the Jeremiah E. Burke High School, um, where I work um, in partnership with. I also represent Dearborn STEM Academy. I also represent, obviously, Success Boston. And um, I just saw someone in the audience that uh, who I also represent. I also represent the John Winthrop Elementary School. Uh, my former uh, principal is also here, um, who I met when I was five. <laughs> Uh, last but not least, I represent AMEND, which stands for Ambitious Men Engaged in Necessary Dialogue, a young men's group that I founded uh, in 2012 with the support of the Success Boston Initiative, uh, and particularly uh, Liliana Mikko. I don't know if she's in the room. Um, oh, she's in class. Okay, she's motivating me to get my doctorate as well. Um, so with that said, I can now begin what... Um, I came here to do. As people were talking, my notes sort of shifted and I kept adding and taking things off um, so that it's appropriate for uh, this conversation. One thing that came to mind was the fact that my race, my ethnicity, and my gender identity is not the reason why I behave the way I do. The labels that we're given or that we take on as people don't necessarily dictate how we behave. It's our sense of self-efficacy or lack thereof. When I was asked to come and speak, um, I was asked three specific questions. And those that know me know that once I begin talking, we can go for days. Uh, some like that, some don't. So uh, for the sake of time and out of respect for time, uh, I'm going to focus on the three questions that I was asked. First question being, uh, can you talk a little bit about getting into and persisting uh, to degree completion and coaching? Um, I met my first coach this summer before my freshman year at UMass Boston. His name was Rob Plummer. Uh, he introduced me to uh, Liliana Mickle and said, in, front, in the cafeteria, he said, you know this woman and you'll be all set. Um, I didn't know what that meant then, but now I know that it's the, the, the power behind relationships 
and having access to Liliana and having access to the people and meeting the people that she introduced me to is what led to um, persistence as well as uh, degree completion. Um, I can tell you stories. Uh, I'm looking at Joan now and I remember um, it was a few weeks before graduation and my name wasn't on the list to graduate. And I said, oh, what am I to do? Uh, and of course, I didn't go out and tell anyone. They found out. Um, and Joan uh, made a phone call and made sure that um, I was on that list. May 31st, 2015, I was there with my cap and gown, with my sashes, representing all the programs that I was a part of. Um, that's a prime example of how, I, how and why I persisted, because of relationships. Coaching, what does coaching mean? When I think of coaching, I think of love. And what does that mean? That means safety. And I think some of you have heard this before. If I love someone, then that means that I feel safe around them. That means I can express myself. I can do many when I'm with them. I didn't have just one coach. I had, I don't know, I don't have any, enough fingers on my hands to count how many coaches I've had because of the different connections that I've made within Success Boston. As you can tell, I'm an amalgamation of stories. I'm a collection of different stories from elementary, middle school, high school, college, post um, college, and I'm, I'm here now. Um, I'm going to take a sip. One second. Here's a question that a lot of um, my young people ask me. They may not know my name, but they know my face when I'm in the schools. Jeremiah E. Burke specifically. Um, what do I do? My job, um, when people ask me what, I, what my job is, I say, my job is to teach and remind young people about how much power they have. Self-efficacy. The idea that they have the belief in their ability to accomplish goals. That's what Success Boston instilled in me. Uh, I remember walking down the hallway trying to have a conversation with some of my coaches, and it was impossible because every single second Every single step that we took, there was someone that walked by that they had to say hello to. As some of you know, today, when I'm walking down the halls at UMass Boston or the Jeremiah E. Burke High School or the Dear One STEM Academy, it's the same way because I've learned to say hello to every single person that I see. Love, again. Why do I do what I do? I was having a conversation with uh, my lady about um, purpose. And uh, what I'm about to say has been copyrighted, so those that are taking notes, uh, make sure you quote her. Her name is Nicola Webb. We were having a conversation about purpose, and she told me that our passion, or rather our pain, our stories, the struggles that we go through, they ultimately yield a passion for something. And that passion ultimately becomes the space and the arena in which our purpose is fulfilled. What does that have to do with me? Education is my passion. My purpose, like I said, why I do what I do, is to teach young people about how much power they have and to remind them about how much power they have. As you all know, um, this past Wednesday, um, sounds like aliens in here. Can you hear that? Um, this past Wednesday, one of my, uh, I had to face one of my deepest fears. And, um, the, um, They say that love comes with the risk. And <laughs> my 
Love comes with a risk, but it takes a warrior to be able to understand that risk and love passionately anyway. This is your first experience with that at this level. I wish you, I hope you never have to go through it again. But if I have to wish something today, I wish that you never lose your compassion for that and then take that passion and turn it into the work that you know has to be done. Don't you know how much and how grateful I am that you're in that space and that you can continue to do this in this work and we have you out here relating to these young people. And so you continue to tell this story and don't you ever feel, I'm glad you feel comfortable enough as a man to be in this room showing the kind of passion and shedding those tears. We all have shed those tears over that incident, but you were there. And so I'm so grateful for you, man. So you come on back up to this microphone. And you do your thing. This past um, Wednesday is still some somewhat seems like it's a dream. I said that love comes with a risk. One of those risks is um, loss and pain that comes from loss. As I was sitting in the the audience watching um, the presentations and listening to the presentations about the success um, that comes with coaching and success Boston. All I kept looking for was faces and all that kept popping up in my head was faces. Faces of the young people, the Latino, the Asian, the black, the Cape Verdeans um, to be specific, that I work with on a daily basis. And we're talking about success. Success is defined differently for every single student. And when I think about Raekwon and I think about just the smile on his face, the, the I remember a, a, a class that he was in. It was a group of nine of us, or nine, or 11, including myself and um, the other gentleman who was co-facilitating the class, Mr. Greg Hill, who invited me to come in and uh, do some work with the young men. Out of nine of those men, nine of those young men, two of those young men have remained. Every single um, student has dropped um, either out of school or they are locked up right now. Raekwon and um, Elvin, and I'm sure there are a couple more who I haven't seen in a while, but I pray that they're, they're doing well. But Raekwon and Elvin are the two that sort of left but still came back and continued to do the work, continued to fight. And even as he took his last breath, he fought. So when we think about these numbers, I challenge every single person in this room to put a face to every single number that's up there. And I've mentioned this before. My aim here is to humanize this education process. A lot of times we talk about funding, which is great. We talk about data and how things look great as far as numbers. But at the end of the day, we're talking about human beings. We're talking about human lives. We're talking about children. And I challenge everybody in this room today whether on your way, leaving here, or tonight, whenever, to ask yourself, why do you do what you do? Why do you do the work that you do? How is your, your pain, how is your story attached to your passion? And how is your passion attached to your ultimate purpose? Ponder that, because those are the questions that the young people are asking themselves. This teacher doesn't care. 
If they don't care, why don't they care? Why are they in that space? And if for the ones that are there, why do they care so much? It's because it's a personal connection. Again, I challenge you to ask yourself, why do you do what you do? I'll keep it there. So voice is important, and voice matters, and this work is personal, so thank you, Manny. Thank you for sharing with us the people behind the numbers. I'd also like to point out that our partners are brave, and our partners are strong, and we're hanging in there together, and we're going to keep going. With apologies to all of you, we're not going to turn to questions, and I'm sorry that we've run out of time to do that. What I'd like to do is actually turn back to the panel to share any closing thoughts. We got. About half of our students are making it to a post-secondary, half of the students who enroll are making it to a post-secondary credential. What do we do for the other half? How do we make sure that all students are safe and successful in their lives? And I'll, I'll throw that open and you can go in any order you like. So I'll start by saying I think it's important that we continue the measurement approach that, that we're taking. Continue to understand the benefit that we're getting from the coaches in Success Boston and then figure out how do we apply that to that other half that you just mentioned, and what can we do to get them into the fold so they'll see the same success as others. So pay attention with us, not just to us. Um, it is really amazing how much one word of encouragement or discouragement, either way, makes the difference between their being courageous enough to step foot across that door at the college. When you're vulnerable, when you're trying to fight your way um, into a system that you're really an immigrant in, 50% uh, of those students are immigrants in their own system. Um, they don't know the landscape. One word from you makes a difference. So I would ask that of you. So every young person, when they look at us and when they have conversations with adults, the question they're asking themselves is, uh, how do I get there? How do I be someone who is successful? How do I make a difference or have the ability to make a difference in the world around uh, us? And so they are always questioning how they get there, and we've got to be able to give them the tools to be where we are at. And, and when you um, look in their eyes, love them like they're your own, um, when you look at them, love them like you're looking at yourself, see yourself in them, but also see beyond yourself to an unbelievable future and unbelievable potential that they all can have. And just so, um, and then hold yourself and others accountable, you know, for all this work. Uh, to be able to come to the table with a mind that allows for you to um, be willing to understand that you aren't filled with all the answers, that this partnership is much better together than um, to try to approach it in some kind of maverick, unresponsive kind of way. And so, and remember when you were uh, Manny, don't be so cold in your thinking and so above that that you can't still have that passion for the work and for somebody else's life. You know, that switch doesn't turn off and turn on, man. So you want to carry that with you a long time. I wish you nothing but that as you go forward, this notion of passion and the notion of being able to do something about all of this. And so grateful to have you in this game. I just re remind everybody again of the self-interest that we all have in making this work. Uh, Commissioner of Higher Education Santiago was in this very room, in this spot last week, releasing the new vision project uh, 
and uh, among other things, it shows that uh, you know within 10 years we're going to be short about 65,000 bachelor degree holders in order to keep this economy where it is, as opposed to sliding down. So we have, and there's no way to do that to, to close that gap without getting the kids who are in uh, Success Boston across the finish line. There's just no, there's just no way to do it. But the other thing that translates into is these kids can get across that line, there's going to be tremendous opportunity for them. No question. Tremendous opportunity. I guess I have the last word. It's, it's almost nothing to say, uh, really. Um, Manny, thank you. Uh, Manny and I have had a couple of conversations over the last couple of days, and so I think it all just kind of hit me as well. Um, keep going, Boston. I mean, I think that's, that's the story here. We see some promise. Uh, you came here because you were interested. I want you to be clear about why you came here. You didn't just come here to listen to a presentation. You've got to walk out of the room and start to do some things on behalf of young people in the city. Wherever you're working, there is a role for you. Um, there's a labor organizer in Texas by the name of Andy Stern who makes uh, a distinction between mobilizing and organizing. We need both, but I want you to be clear that we need to organize. And what he says about mobilizing is that it's bringing the voices together that need to raise the issue or air the public grievance. We continue to need that. And actually, we need voices now to celebrate the, the progress that we've seen here. But organizing, he says, is really about getting people together to create the alternatives and the new possibilities. And so it's kind of this fat faith in intention without deeds is dead kind of thing. So we expect that you will both mobilize and organize. Uh, on behalf of the mayor, I look forward uh, to hearing from each and every one of you about the work that we should be doing uh, with you to move the city forward. Our goal is to make sure that Boston has a seamless early care through career system. If it is not that in structure, it should at least be experienced that way by students and families. It can only be built if we're all doing the shared work in all of the places that we are. So this is a day to celebrate. This is also a day to recognize that Boston has a lot of work to do, and we've got to support our young people. So thank you. Right. Well, I'd like to just add my thanks first to all of you for being here. Um, second to our research team, Joe McLaughlin and the team from The Pick, Tamara Linko and the team from APT. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you. And to all of our speakers, thank you so much for helping us understand how important this work is and why we have to keep going. There's room for all of you in this work, so we hope we'll, you'll continue on with us. And thanks again for being here. Thank you.